Good evening. Let's go ahead and get started tonight. And uh, I was just running a little bit behind, uh, chit-chatting with Pastor Hutchinson, and, and we always have a good time when we talk. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here, and uh, let's uh, enjoy the Lord tonight. We just have a few things that we want to cover as far as uh, on our calendar of events. We have Love God's Peeps Banquet, so there's a sign-up sheet for that. Please please do the, the unbaptist thing and sign the sheet, okay? And, uh, and so uh, there's some index cards where you're going to sign your name and then maybe put two or three different uh, things that could be a blessing to you and a help. Um, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to divvy those out night of the banquet, and then we're going to spend maybe the next week or two uh, trying to accomplish those acts of kindness or love uh, with, the, with the hope that maybe some of us will spend some time with somebody that we don't normally spend some time with and get to know them and uh, love on them as part of the body. And I figured that would be a great uh, time of fellowship and uh, benefit for the church. And that is for anybody that wants to come. You don't have to be married. You don't have to have a sweetheart honey bun. Uh, you just come and be a part of that. It'll be a blessing. Prime timers are going to be doing 1010 uh, uh, on February the 10th. And then the teens and young adults are going to be having uh, a game night, I think, right? To be determined. That'll be February the 9th. Uh, every Sunday at 530, we're going to be doing a practice session uh, for those that are involved in music. And so uh, if you are going to be excuse me, <laughs> if you are going to be um, involved in the music program in any way, that'll be a great time for you to come be there and uh, you can have a time of practice for your songs and uh, we'll be practicing for the services coming up and uh, just offer that out to you. so be mindful of that. Uh, also uh, there was another sign up sheet out front. And that was for the 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 database. The, the, database. Um, the database is we're trying to put all of our contacts into one database so that we can send out a mass email if we need to get in touch and make communication with everybody rather than having to call every phone number. And so just please be mindful of that. Uh, if you think, oh, we already got your information, just do me a favor and double check that. Put it on the index card that's on the clock table and then put it in Miss Tracy's office in her little uh, desk tray, right, that sits on the corner, and she'll be uh, implementing those as we go forward. So thank you for your help in there. And again, please be mindful to uh, stay faithful to your uh, mission supports. We have uh, one more mission circle that we're waiting on uh, to figure out what we are going to do with the excess that we had for our missions program. And uh, I think what uh, Brother Shea and I are planning to do is take that amount that we have and divide it between the four circles, and then you can pick which missionary in that circle that you think would, would benefit from uh, that, that money the best that we can. We'll send that out as a church, but the mission circles will be able to send a note along with that, and I think that'll be an encouragement uh, I, I love that that'll be a connection between the mission circles and the missionary, and uh, we'll do that. Uh, so uh, we're, we're waiting on one more. As soon as we do that, we'll get that expeditiously going. All right, let's go ahead and worship the Lord tonight. And so if you'll stand, uh, we're going to turn to page number one, My Savior's Love. <clears throat> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean Sing out! Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful And my song shall ever be Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden 
pardon. He prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for my. Let me hear you. How marvelous! And my song shall ever be. How marvelous! How wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous! And my song shall ever be. How marvelous! Is my Savior's love for me. Amen. I hope you stand amazed in God's love. Uh, it is amazing. All right, we're going to sing nearer, still nearer, 204. No matter what you go through in your Christian life, God never leaves us. God never forsakes us. He's always near. He's always at hand with His children. You go through the darkest time of your life, you can rest assured that Christ is there. Even when you don't realize it, He's there. Amen? Let's sing this song and worship the Lord. Nearer, still nearer, close to Thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious Thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring, not as an offering to Jesus my King. Only my sinful, now contrite heart, grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me thy cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last. Till safe glory my anchor is cast through endless ages ever to be nearer my Savior still nearer to thee nearer my Savior Still nearer to thee. I'm going to have the pianist just play through that course one more time. Just take time to bump elbows with one another. You don't have to shake hands. Just keep distance. Uh, just, just smile at somebody. Don't mean mug anybody. Let's be friendly tonight.
All right. Amen. Looks like you had uh, some time to fellowship and you did a great job. Thank you for that. I'm just going to uh, loosen the vocal cords here. Isn't this a cute little water? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, drink its parents later. That's hitting the spot. So after I preach on Sunday morning, my voice is always strained. And uh, so uh, Dixon showed me a good uh, trick that I can do uh, with the microphone. He said we have to keep it uh, right at an inch, and then I can go a little soft, and then go a little louder. So <clears throat> we'll try that and see if that'll save my voice. So you sing along with us. We're going to do Highly Exalted. Uh, these are some that uh, we have practiced, and they're the newer ones. And so uh, sing out nice and loud with me if you don't know it. We'll, we'll learn this together. <clears throat> You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by even averted their gaze from the side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spake not a word, but chose to be silent, though you did no wrong nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come, yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name, He has enthroned you on high, Jesus, the name above all names. God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name above all names. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spake not a word chose to be silent you did no wrong nor was deceitfulness found in you yet by your words our salvation has come yet by your suffering our freedom is won for god has highly exalted your name he has enthroned you on high, Jesus, the name above all names. God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high, Jesus, the name above all names. Amen. Amen. God's highly exalted Jesus, hasn't he? And uh, I tell you, our Lord is worthy of that, uh, that title, that exaltation, and good singing. Let's go on to Who You Say I Am. You know, <clears throat> I think of the title of this song and the message of it. It's great that I know who Jesus is, but, you know, the greater thing is that Jesus knows who I am. And, uh, and I'm glad that I am who he says that I am. And so praise the Lord. <clears throat> Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. 
I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the Son sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. For TJ. I don't know about you guys, I'm tired tonight. If I pass out, it's because I haven't eaten, so I'll be fine. Okay, so if you guys were here last week, uh, I said I was going to do another sermon on uh, verses 3 through 5, and I figured that after talking with RJ that it was probably just going to be uh, too much repetition. Uh, I didn't want you guys to feel like I preached the same sermon twice. So uh, from verses 1 and 2 last week, uh, we learned that God's given us the privilege uh, to be able to cast judgment, uh, to be able to say, hey, that's good, and hey, that's bad. And we have that ability through his words. Um, and verses 3 through 5, I mean, verses 3 through 5 are really that concept applied. Everything we learned in verses 1 and 2 well, verses 3 and 5 is the actual application of that. Um, so we are able to judge. Uh, but what we learned last week is that there are three stipulations uh, to our judging. It's not just, oh, good, I have a Bible. Let me go, you know, chop people's heads off with it. Uh, the one thing that we need to keep in mind is we have to make sure that our life, uh, it's got to be in line with God's words before we go about trying to correct other people's lives. So verses 3 through 5, famous passage with, you know, the moat in somebody else's eye and the beam in yours. If your life isn't in line with God's words, and if your life isn't blameless, well, then you're just a hypocrite. And then when you try to use God's words and apply them to somebody else, they're going to completely reject those things, and it's going to be uh, totally unprofitable. So that's the first thing. Second thing was make sure that when you were casting judgment, Make sure you do it with humility, considering your own self and considering, well, you may not struggle with that particular sin, but you struggle with other things. And you might not struggle with something right now, but there's no telling that in the future, you might not fall to that same thing. And then remembering always that the same words that we're using to cast judgment on other people's life, well, God's going to use those words to judge our life. So how comfortable are you with that? And lastly, you're going to cast judgment on somebody else, make sure that you're doing it for the edifying of the other person and not just, you know, oh, I have God's words. I get to go tell everybody where they're wrong in their life. Or I get to use God's words to say, oh, I think I'm doing that one really good. So I'm going to go call out somebody else to kind of puff up my own self. If you're doing it from the position of pride, you're wrong. Uh, casting judgment and, and edifying the body, well, that's the whole point. If it's for the edification of the other person, and you do it in charity, well, then the body starts to build itself up. And if we can get this straight, it will change the spirit of our church. Uh, we could really get this down. 
this year. I mean, it goes right in line with our theme. So that's all I'm going to say on three through five. We're going to leave that one there, and we're going to move into six. So if you have your Bibles, grab uh, Matthew 7, verse 6, and that's where we'll be tonight. Uh, as you flip there, I'm going to open in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for your words, and always, Lord, for the privilege uh, to be able to speak them. Lord, you have commanded everyone that speaks your words to speak them as the oracles of God, to speak them with authority. That authority, Lord, comes from the words themselves. Uh, it does not come from the preacher, nor does it come from uh, even the way that he speaks. Your words are the truth. Your words uh, are everything, God. So I thank you and pray that today uh, the speaking of your words would be to the edifying of your church, um, and that your words themselves would be magnified high and that you would be glorified. God, be with my speech and my mouth. Uh, let not my outline lock me in. But Lord, pray that your spirit would have liberty uh, to say through me anything that you desire tonight. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so Matthew 7, 6. I think this is going to be a fun one. Uh, you're either going to hate how I lined this up, or you're going to love it. There's really no in-between, so apologies in advance if you hate it. But our text this week is one of those Matthew verses that throughout, you know, history, well, it's been commonly misunderstood. Uh, so I think this will be a fun one to go through. Matthew 7, 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, <clears throat> lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So the reason this passage is so easily misapplied is because upon first reading of that, well, it, it seems like it's pretty clear. You could just read that and you can say, well, what that's saying is don't take things that are precious and valuable and throw them before uh, individuals who don't see the value or, you know, or are hostile to you. And that's how it's been used in the past, and it's not even necessarily a wrong thought. But what you're doing when you do that is you're, you are assuming meaning upon Bible words that the Bible has already defined in other places. Uh, if you use that, um, that application, you have, you have already defined dogs, you've defined swine, you've defined what's holy, uh, you've defined trample, you've defined rend. All these words, they're Bible words that if, if you would compare the scriptures with themselves, and if you would let God's words do the talking, you would find that the definitions of these words Actually, they, they, open up the, they open up the meaning and the richness of the text that, you know, you could just leave it there at that surface level reading, or you could go into the Bible and you could actually study it and you could find the riches that God has in his word if you would mine it out. And the only way that we do that is we do that uh, through comparing the scripture with scripture. That's what we do. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. John 6.63 tells us that God's words are spirit and life. So when, we're, when we are comparing spiritual things with spiritual, what the word of God has instructed us to do is to mine its meanings and figure out what it's saying and, and being taught of the Spirit through comparing God's words with God's words. That's what we do around here. That's our hermeneutic, which hermeneutic is just uh, how do you interpret the Bible. Our hermeneutic is we compare Scripture with Scripture, and that's how we get what we get. It's very uncommon these days because it takes work, and it really keeps you from being able to say whatever you want. You can't just make a word say whatever because the words have their own meaning. So today, I want to put uh, this comparing scripture with scripture thing under the or under the magnifying glass. Like that's all we're going to do today. We're just going to compare scripture with scripture, and we're going to define what these words mean. And by defining these words, we're going to see multiple different applications come out of this passage that you would miss if you just read it. And I hope that today this will show you, man, there is. Huge value in studying God's word. 
there's value in just reading God's word, but there is another level of value that you only find through study. You only find through defining words and comparing scriptures. So I hope that today you'll be able to see that. There is a key, or there are key applications for the Jews who this book was written to. Let's not forget that. And there's key application for the church that I think as you guys look at it, uh, you'll see it's an application that we have got real lazy on and kind of abandoned uh, throughout the years. So Matthew 7, 6, as we move through this, we're just going to define our key words. So we're going to define what is the holy thing that's being thrown under the dogs? What are dogs? And then where it says, neither cash ye your pearls before swine, well, what? What are the pearls? And then what are the swine? What, what, what's being trampled underfoot? Why are those words being used? And then what, what is being rent? So if we just start with that which is holy, well, what is that which is holy? This one's the easiest one. The Lord is holy. So things that are holy are things that belong to the Lord. So the Lord is the epitome of perfection and separation. You'll find hundreds of references about the Lord being holy. So if something is set apart for the Lord, well, then it's holy. Easy peasy. So what belongs to the Lord that would be defined as holy? Well, the Lord has a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. We've been talking about that uh, every week, basically, in Matthew. His kingdom, well, it has... His name on it. Also, you have the kingdom of God. His kingdoms are holy. They belong to him. Uh, God has a land called the land of Israel, Jerusalem. That's a holy city unto the Lord. It belongs to God. Uh, God has a people. They're called the Jews. They belong to the Lord. They are a holy, set-apart people for himself. Uh, <clears throat> Leviticus 27.30. I actually forgot my reference. But as you see on the screen, tithes and offerings, those belong to the Lord. They're his. They're holy unto him. Uh, God has sacrifices that belong to him, that he laid out for the Jews, that they were supposed to do uh, for the glory of the Lord and his pleasure. God has words, scriptures, that he gave specifically to the Jewish people. They're his words. They're holy. God has a temple that's holy. It's where he was going to live and dwell among the children of Israel. And then he has a priesthood that was set apart for himself. And this is just a short list of things that God gave the Jews. He said, these are, these are yours, but, but they're really mine. So those are just a short list of holy things. So what about the pearls? When it says, cast ye your pearls, well, what's being spoken of there? Well, if you look at Matthew 13, verse 45, the kingdom of heaven itself is likened unto pearls. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So there's a kingdom that, that Jesus Christ came down to earth. He saw it, he loved it, he bought it. Well, that's the kingdom of heaven. And that has other implications as well, being going down to people. But the kingdom of heaven... So Jesus Christ bought and paid for with his life. Also the church later on. Dogs and swine. This is where we're going to spend most of our time because we've, we've defined our holy things. Uh, we've defined pearls. There's another definition for pearls, which we'll, we'll come on to later. But dogs and swine is where we're going to spend most of our time because once we define the dogs and the swine, well, then, then you understand why you don't cast holy things to them, and why you don't cast your pearls to them. So dogs and swine, if you were to throw the word dogs or the word swine into your Bible app uh, or your concordance or whatever, you're going to find a lot of references. They actually come up a lot. So if you look at 1 Kings 21, verse 23, here's the first thing we learn about dogs. So it says, And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. So the first thing we learn about dogs, and you're going to find this every time you look it up, basically. 
They're always eating something. They're, that's, that's what they're doing in the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah 15, 3. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay and the dogs to tear and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. So dogs, well, they consume and they tear things. And I don't know how much farm background you guys have, but you know, if you're in redneck territory and you want to get rid of a body, well, what do you give it to? Pigs. Weird. Pigs. Well, they'll eat anything. It doesn't, I mean, you can throw anything in there and they're going to tear it up and they're going to eat it. And dogs and swine in the Bible, well, that's what they're doing. They're eating, they're tearing, they're consuming, and they're doing it. I mean, they, don't, they do it with, without care, they do it without preference, and they do it without distinction. It doesn't matter to them. You throw it in, they're going to eat it. You'll see later on why that's important. But that's what dogs do in the Bible. So another thing about dogs, because, because of the fact that they'll eat anything, and they'll eat anything dead, living, doesn't matter, well, dogs and swine, well, in the Bible, they're incredibly unclean and defiled beasts. So Deuteronomy 14.8, <clears throat> God says, The swine, because it divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud, it is unclean unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. So no eating pigs in the Old Testament, because they're filthy. Isaiah 66.3, He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth increase, as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. So in this list of abominations that we find being offered to the Lord, the Lord's saying, your, your sacrifices and offerings, they're so disgusting to me because of your sin and wickedness that you might as well cut off a dog's neck. The context of this passage is letting you know that God's disgusted by those things. A dog is filthy. Uh, swine's blood, filthy. Abomination to the Lord, he hates it. So when you're reading the Bible and you find dogs or swine, they, they are an unclean animal. And then right along those lines, <clears throat> this is what we usually think about dogs when we read the New Testament. Is it swine and dogs? Well, what they typify in the Bible? Well, they, they typify unclean Gentiles. That's what we usually think. So here's Matthew 15, 25. That's where it comes from. So, <clears throat> then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. So if you remember the context of this verse, who's coming to him asking for help? Well, it's a Canaanite woman. Not a Jew. So a Canaanite Gentile comes to Jesus asking for help. And he's like, mm -mm, you're a dog. And you read that and you're like, man, that's crazy. But I mean, an unsaved Gentile separated from Israel, dead in her sins and transgressions, well, she is unclean. She is gross to the Lord. That's what we were before we got saved. So he's not out of bounds. Uh, for calling her that. So, Galatians 2.15, Paul has a similar sentiment. It says, <clears throat> we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Paul feels the same way. Gentiles, to the Lord, lost in their sins, they're gross. Dogs and swine, well, they, they, they typify uh, an unsaved Gentile. So now, let's put all this together, having defined holy things, having defined swine, dogs, pearls. Let's put all that together to get our Jewish application. So, what he's telling them in this passage is that the holy things that belong to God, that belong to the Jews, his people, well, they're not for those that are outside of the covenant of circumcision. So, the things that God gave to the Jews, he gave to the Jews. They weren't for the Gentiles. Exodus 12, 48 <clears throat> says, When a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, 
Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So the sacrifices, the offerings of the Lord, uh, these things, they, they weren't for somebody who was uncircumcised, because that meant they were outside of the nation of Israel. If they wanted to partake in the holy things, if they wanted to draw near to the temple and be a part of worshiping the Lord, well, they had to be circumcised. They had to be under the umbrella of the covenant. And if they weren't, it wasn't for them. Ezekiel 44, 9, Thus saith the Lord God, No stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. So the things that God gave Israel, he gave Israel. So when he's telling them, well, don't take your holy things and cast them unto dogs, and don't take your pearls and cast them unto swine, he's telling them, don't give the things that I gave you to the Gentiles because they're holy. And they don't understand the value in these things. You, in your saved body right now, you're a saved individual. Let's teleport you back to the Old Testament and have you watch a uh, sacrifice. You know, are you, are you looking at that? Even having the Bible, are you going to look at the high priest, you know, pulling up a little baby lamb and slitting its throat and spreading its blood everywhere? Are you going to be like, oh, that is just so precious. What a holy thing. This makes so much sense to me. I'm so thankful that I was able to be a part of this. No, you're going to look at that and be like, this is disgusting. This is gross. What the heck kind of God is this? He likes blood thrown all over the place? This is, no, I don't want any part of it. Well, that's why you don't give holy things to people who, who they don't understand what's happening. So, and that's just one example. So, closer to our text and what we are talking about and have been talking about this whole time, another Jewish application is that the blessing, which was the kingdom of heaven, well, it, wasn't, it was for the Jew. It wasn't for the Gentile. This helps us understand some of the crazy passages that we find in Matthew, like Matthew 10, 5, where Jesus tells the disciples, mm. well, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, that sounds just like Matthew 28, right? Go into the whole world and make ye disciples and baptize everybody. And That's completely different. Don't go to the Gentiles. Only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Only go to the Jew. Well, why? Well, because the kingdom of heaven, the Jewish, literal, physical kingdom, was for the Jews, the pearl that was the kingdom of heaven. Well, it, it wasn't for the Gentile, at least not right now. Not in the context of Matthew 7. And likewise, Matthew 15, 22, we already talked about this, but when that Canaanite woman comes to him and says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, addressing him as the king of the Jews, he answered her, not a word. Didn't even look at her. Turned his back, and his disciple came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Lord, she's annoying. Get this Gentile Canaanite lady out of here. We don't, she's bugging us. So then he answers and said, I am, not, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. So at the context of Matthew, when he's saying, Don't cast your pearls before swine, he's telling them, This kingdom, it's not for the Gentiles. I'm bringing it to you. Don't waste it. Now we know that he ended up having mercy on this woman, but how do you guys think the Jews did with their command from Jesus Christ to not take the holy things that he gave them, and to not, not allow the Gentiles to come in and pollute them, and to not to tell them, hey, this is your kingdom. Please accept it. I'm begging you. Well, what do you think they did? Remember what the Jews said before they crucified Christ? 
after they rejected their kingdom. We have no king but Caesar. Well, the Jews were supposed to have a king. They were given a holy king that belonged to them for their kingdom of heaven. Well, they, they didn't obey this commandment. They dumped their kingdom off to the Romans. They say, we have no king but Caesar. Please occupy us. Stay here. We like being under tribute. But you know what happened to the Jews in A.D. 70? You know what happened to God's holy lands? You know what happened to God's temple and God's people? They said they wanted no king but Caesar. Well, they got him, and they came, and the Romans completely destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They crush everything, and then weird. You know what they do? Oh, they trample it underfoot. It's almost like that's what he said was going to happen. In Matthew 7, 6, if they didn't keep their holy things, if they didn't cast their pearls before swine, what he warned them about happened not long after he warned them about it. The Romans came and they destroyed everything and they trampled God's holy things underfoot because the Jews didn't keep them. And you know what's going to happen in the future? Well, the Jews are going to take now having, I mean, they have their land back, uh, they're going to have a temple uh, in the future. I mean, they'll have sacrifices up and going. And everything's going to be great. Well, then they're going to give themselves over to the Antichrist. And they're going to, again, give the things which are holy uh, to the dogs. And they're going to invite the Antichrist into the temple. And he's going to sit there where he doesn't belong. And he's going to sit there showing that he is God. And then ultimately what he's going to bring on them is the thing that came on them the first time they let this happen. We have no king but Caesar. We want Rome. Well, they're going to get Rome, and they're going to get Rome twice, and he's going to bring a war on that city. And just like it happened the first time, it's going to happen again. They're going to trample that city underfoot, and God's people are going to be slain. That's what Matthew 7, 6 is talking about in a Jewish context. Now, if we bring this back to the church because there is great application for the church. Back to Matthew 7, 6. Now, we consider this from a New Testament context. We're going to use our same definitions, which we've already defined, but we're going to expand them even just a little more. Because the church, the church has their own holy things. We might not have a temple that we come to or we might not have, uh, you know, we're not killing sheep or whatever, but we have holy things given to us from the Lord that belong to him. We have God's words. It's the church's job and the church's responsibility to steward the words of God and not let them slip into the hands of some unsaved person so that they can rend them and, and, and tear our words from us. We have ordinances, baptism. Communion. Well, who are those for? Well, they're not for lost people. Those belong only to saved people. You're not getting baptized unless you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit first. You don't sprinkle babies. And you're not taking communion if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't just pass that out like candy to whoever wants to have it. At that point, you are taking holy things, and you're just throwing them out there like they're completely worthless. The church has leadership that's supposed to be holy and set apart for the Lord. You don't just let anybody walk in, into a church, a good businessman maybe, or somebody who's got great organizational skills. Well, they don't just get to come in and be the leadership. Churches are doing that now more and more and more, and it's just an organization. Church leadership belongs to a pastor and deacons. And then we've got scriptural knowledge that is holy and precious to the Lord. You don't, just, you don't just sit down with a lost person and be like, oh, let me tell you about, you know, let me tell you about the mystery that is baptism or the mystery that is uh, what's going to happen in Revelation. Like, what they need is the gospel. You don't, you don't sit down and just throw these things to lost people because they're going to look at it and they're going to be like, this is stupid. None of this makes any sense to me. Corinthians tells us that, that spiritual truth, it, it's lost on lost people. They don't get it. So, 
what we talked about before, where you know you don't give holy things to people who don't value them. That is a valid uh, doc or devotional application of this text. But what that doesn't mean, which somehow it's come to mean this over the years, this does not mean to not preach the gospel to the lost or to those that are hostile to the gospel because they might turn on you and rend you. Like, that's not what this is saying. We have a precious message, and it does need to go. It needs to go to the dogs, and it needs to go to the swine. It needs to go to the unclean and the unholy. That's literally who the gospel is for, so that they can get saved. How this has been twisted to mean, oh, well, they look scary, so or they're not nice, so we can't give them the gospel. That's who the gospel is for. Don't let that application be drawn into this text. But you would be wise to understand that our message is precious, and we shouldn't handle it cheaply. You don't take the gospel and then throw it and waste it. If you've shared the gospel with an individual multiple times, and they're just, they're not jamming with you. They are not having it. Or if they are hostile after multiple times of trying to reach them, and they are very not interested, and they have made it very clear that they're not interested through all the different ways that the world can let you know they're not interested in what you have. Pro tip, leave them alone. Just leave them alone. Pray for them. Look for other opportunities, but get out of their face. Like, or they're going to get in your face. Save yourself. Titus 3.10, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Knowing that, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. If you've tried two, three, four times, leave that person alone. Pray for them. Pray that the Lord will do a work in their life, and then they'll come and find you. And there's another thing. Don't take the precious truths of God's word and then go online to argue with unsaved people. Like, what, what is that profiting you? What is that profiting anybody? The people on YouTube that, like, they see a video and then they, like, have to type something? Like, why? You have precious truth and precious words. You're wasting your time throwing that out there. If people don't see the value of the gospel and, and the truth of God's word, move on to somebody who might. Now, here's the one I really want to talk about. Dogs and swine have one more uh, definition, you could say, through the scriptures. And that is a false teacher. So look at 2 Peter 2, verse 1. So if you were to open your Bible right now and read all of 2 Peter 2, the context of 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, from start to finish, it's all false teachers. So look at verse 1. <clears throat> Peter says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So he sets the context. False prophets, false teachers, people who are bringing in things in the church that they ought not. Well, now look at the last verse in the chapter, verse 22. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Who is the them of verse 22? Well, Nothing changed in the context throughout the whole thing. Go home and read it. Dogs and swine are likened to false teachers. That's who Peter is addressing. So now if we view our verse with this, well, now we get into some totally different waters. Paul also says in Philippians 3.2, <clears throat> Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. So if you go back to Philippians and look at the context, what he's talking about, these dogs, these evil workers, these concision, well, they're teaching that you need to be circumcised to be saved. 
They're teaching a false doctrine of works. Dogs are false teachers. Swine are false teachers. They teach a corrupted form of salvation. Now, bring this definition into everything else that we've learned about dogs and swine. Well, false teachers, they're unclean. They're defiled. They are either unsaved and somehow they snuck in and they made themselves look like they're good and holy, or they are saved. And somewhere along the line, they chose to depart from the Lord. They chose to depart from the truth. They saw money or they saw power and they saw some reason to subvert God's words for their own gain. And what they do is they consume everything that is precious and holy. Without, they do it without distinction. They do it for their own gain. They don't care. They're going to get what they want regardless of who they have to trample over and destroy in the process. That's what a false teacher does. They're a dog. They consume. They're filthy. And do you know that the church has, we have some other things that are holy, not just the Word of God. We have one resource that is so precious, one commodity that is so holy and so belonging to the Lord, it's actually what he died for. The most holy thing the church has, it's our responsibility to keep. That's our people. That's our young, newly saved people. That's our been saved 20 years people. I don't know if you guys remember, but probably two weeks ago now, or two sermons ago, we spent a ton of time defining pearls because we were talking about rewards. Pearls, which we learned, pearls are people. Pearls, biblically, are a precious stone, which are people that the Lord loves, that he's going to draw onto himself. They're his. He bought them. He owns them. And these pearls are the souls of men, souls that belong to the church. Newly saved individuals, people who have been saved for a long time, doesn't matter. They are not to be cast to dogs, and they are not to be cast to swine. This is this is our biggest and this is our biggest responsibility inside of the church to take care of the people that we have, the people that somehow, some way, have the humility to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, it's our responsibility to keep them and to protect them and to grow them. Too frequently, someone gets led to the Lord, and then whether it's through laziness or whether it's through a lack of vigilance, or whether it's just for who knows. Somehow, that newly saved, precious soul that could grow up through the Scriptures to serve the Lord, well, somehow, they get tangled up by something else that's false. Somehow, a Calvinist gets a hold of them. Somehow, they find somebody on YouTube that's teaching some crazy thing because you have everything available to you now. You can go be whatever. Or the Jehovah's Witness shows up at their door. And they just got saved yesterday. Oh, and then there's the Jehovah's Witness. Person is ripe to be stolen. And then somebody gets a hold of them. And then that false teacher absolutely and utterly destroys them. Nothing will destroy your life more than going down paths of heresy. The most miserable times of my life were the times when I was uh, believing Calvinism or the times when I was a charismatic. They don't know anything. They are so backwards and upside down. They have no hope, no peace, no security, and they're in darkness. And that's what false teachers lead people into. And it's the church's responsibility to protect them and to not just let them wander off to the next false teacher that comes knocking. If you lead somebody to Christ, they are your responsibility. Your responsibility to disciple. Your responsibility to establish in the faith. Your responsibility to show them an example of how to walk before the Lord. And if you, for some reason, see that individual being led astray by 
some wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, the only way that that wolf should be able to get to them had better be over your dead body. Every possible means that you could use to keep them from that individual, you had better use and you had better employ. One of the guys from my old work, I remember his, uh, you know, it took months and months and months to get his brother saved. And I remember just the anguish and the agony that I saw in the person who led him to Christ when this guy got led astray by a Calvinist church. They didn't do anything to lead him to Christ. They, didn't, they weren't any part of that. But then as soon as he got saved, oh, now they're real interested in him. Now they want to be his friend. Now they want to be his buddy. They didn't care when he was lost, going to hell. But now that he's in a Bible-believing church, they, they can't have that. Now they're real interested. And I remember how just torn up this guy was when he had to watch you know, his young disciple be led astray. And it, I mean, and it was over his dead body. Like, he did everything he could to, to, to keep this guy. But he went astray in his own paths. But it is your responsibility to watch out for the dogs and the swine and the wolves in sheep's clothing that are trying to actually destroy the people that you led to Christ. These people you lead to Christ are your children. Paul calls Timothy his son in the faith. You wouldn't just let somebody walk into your house and be like, oh, here, take my child. Whatever. Like, I'm just going to bite my tongue there. I almost said something I'd regret. <clears throat> but your kids are your responsibility. You're not going to give them to somebody else to raise. So you wouldn't do the same thing with a false teacher. So that puts something on you. If you can't cast your holy things under the dogs and you can't cast your pearls before swine, well, that means now what's well, up to you then? to raise them. Are you able to do that? Are you equipped to do that? Are you ready to do that? Could you go lead somebody to Christ right now and then the next day sit them down and be like, all right, this is what we got to do. This is the stuff that you got to learn. This is the stuff that you need to be walking in. This is, are you ready for that? And if they have questions about their life and the world and things that they're going through, are, I mean, are you equipped and ready to sit down with them and walk them through those things? If your job is to make disciples, to, to see people saved and make disciples, are you equipped to make a disciple? There's too many people who just, they lead somebody to Christ and then they leave them. That could be why there's so many cults around. Because we got all these spiritual babies running around, being drawn away, as Paul says, by every wind of doctrine. Well, it's your job to lead them. So therefore, the burden is on you to make sure that you can be a spiritual parent to somebody. You wouldn't just have a kid and then you would hopefully wait to have a child before you know, I'm ready to be a parent. Well, you need to be ready to be a spiritual parent. You need to be grounded in the word yourself. That's why we come to church. That's why we sit under teaching. That's why we study our Bibles. That's why you put in the work and the effort so that when finally, after four years, you're able to lead somebody to Christ, well, then you can disciple them. This is our responsibility as a church, Romans 3, 4. We're way too trusting, I think. I'm, I'm closing up with this. Paul says, <clears throat> let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. When you see somebody with a Bible and you, you think, oh man, they're so nice and they're so godly. Like, what do you think of them upon your first meeting? Are you, you give them the benefit of the doubt and just think, they're probably legit. I think I trust them. Or do you think, no, I, 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 I don't trust you. You have to earn that trust. Because according to Paul, you are to look at every man and, and say, that person is a liar until proven truthful. We have it backwards. We think, oh, well, I need to be nice and I need to, you know, whatever. They say they love Jesus, so I guess I'll just believe them. Absolutely not. 
That, that mentality is what got me into all of my messes in my past. I have learned through failure how to apply this verse. And before I became a Baptist and learned the scriptures, man, I sat down to every meeting with my pastor thinking, you're going to earn my trust. Because every other person with a Bible, I have found to be an absolute fraud and a liar. You've got to prove to me that the things that you're saying are true. And the only way that you're going to prove whether somebody is true and whether they're valid is based on God's words. So it's a weird thing. You have to, you got to trust somebody sometime if you're going to learn the Bible. But you also have to determine, or you have to make the determination to think, man, these people that carry Bibles and say they're Christians and act so godly, you have to assume that everybody is a wicked liar. Because they are. That's what the scriptures say. The only way that a person gets past that and becomes truthful is if they submit their life to the Word of God and the things that they say and the things that they preach, their opinions, everything. Well, they just align that and they surrender that to what God's Word says. So when you see these people hanging around your newly saved people or they're hanging around your kids or they're whatever and they're spiritual, Man, you better vet that person. Or you're not going to vet them, and then three years later, when your son or your daughter is running off into this whatever sect of Christianity, and you see their life starting to fall apart, you're going to be like, man, I wish I would have vetted that person. I wish I would have obeyed the scriptures and said, I think that person is a liar. And sit them down and try to figure out what they believe. And then sit down with your kids and say, this person is a liar, and this is why. Look at these verses. They're not truthful. They are contrary to the Word of God. I remember my, my parents tried to do that with me. Uh, you know, when I was getting into everything, they were like, I don't think this is right. But though they were well-intentioned, they weren't themselves equipped in the Scriptures to be able to give me a valid answer, to be able to sit me down and say, this is why this person is a liar. Don't trust them. Don't follow them. They weren't able to do that. They were just able to give me, they were just able to tell me, ah, I just don't think that's right. And it's, it's my fault for not trusting my parents. But if they would have been able to say, or if they would have been equipped in the scriptures, and when they had been able to sit me down and show me, well, that might have been a different story. We are too trusting of every godly person with the Bible. And just in closing, <clears throat> That last part of Matthew 7, 6, the warning is that if you give, if you give your holy and precious things over to false teachers, well, what they do is they turn and they, they trample them underfoot and they rend you. So the false teacher that you allowed your kid or your newly saved uh, person to be led astray by, well, that false teacher is going to destroy their life and trample them under the ground. But then what they're going to do, if they're good, well, they're going to get your kid or they're going to get your new saved person to believe what they believe. And they're going to go from a sheep to a teacher themselves. And then they're going to come back in and they're going to come back into your church. And they're going to come back into your house. And then what does it mean? What does it mean to rent something? You know, if I rent my suit jacket, well, this is one suit jacket currently. It's one piece of clothing. Well, if I rend it, well, then it's going to be two. Well, that's called a division. So the church is supposed to be of one mind and of one spirit, and there's supposed to be unity in the body. Well, you send your kid off to so-and-so place because you're trusting that so-and-so teachers there are true and right. You allow them to walk outside of your sphere of protection? Well, what happens when they learn some false doctrine? What happens when that gets rooted in their heart? Well, then they're going to bring that home. And, and the house that you were supposed to be protecting and building and guarding, well, now it's going to be rent because your kid is going to be bringing in false doctrines that they learned from so-and-so guy. Or your church. You send a kid off to Bible college, and then they come back, and weird, they don't believe what they believed before. 
I wonder how these churches start Baptist and then 20 years later they become non denoms I wonder how you start with a KJV and you end up with an NIV. Well, they didn't learn that in their church. They went somewhere else, they learned it somewhere else, they brought it back, and then indirectly, you know what the, you know what the false teacher did? He rent you. By his teachings and his philosophies, he doesn't even have to do the work himself. He'll get your holy things and your pearls, your precious things to come back in and destroy you from the inside out. Satan is masterful with what he is doing. And the only reason this has been allowed to fly is because the church allowed parachurch organizations and different things in colleges to train their next generation, their most precious commodity, so that when they come back, they're not what they were, or the church loses their vigilance, and they allow somebody to come in who has no business being a pastor, no business teaching a Sunday school class. It's, it's our fault, just like the Jews. The Jews didn't keep this commandment. They didn't keep their holy things, and they didn't keep their pearls. So they ended up getting trampled on a foot, and they got rent. Well, the church did it to themselves. And going forward, what we must do as a church is we need to set a watch and a guard on our scriptures. And we need to set a watch and a guard on our kids and on our newly saved people and our been saved for a long time people. It's our responsibility to learn the Bible for ourselves and to actually be able to disciple somebody else. Or the church will die. Romans 16, 17. I beseech you therefore, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Is that your kid? Is that you? Is that your newly saved person? False teachers, they don't care about your kid. And string me up the flagpole for this if you want, but colleges don't care about your kid. They care about the tuition money coming in. And they'll, they'll feed your kid lies, and they'll feed your kid whatever, so they'll come and pay them money. They don't care about them. They're doing it with, you know, a thousand other kids. And they're doing it, false teachers are doing it with a thousand other people. They don't care. They serve their own bellies, not our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if they did, they'd build up a local church. They'd work to lead people to Christ and disciple them and send them back into their churches. That's what they do. Grace, if you don't mind, we'll wrap up. <clears throat> As the church, we're stewards. We must keep the things that we've been entrusted with. Whether that's God's words, pure doctrines, or whether that's saved people. It is our job to be vigilant. Consider where you are on these things. Consider what you may have given away. How you can get it back. And how you can better prepare your own self to stand against this. Stand with me in a word of prayer as we close. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for your words. I thank you for the depths of the riches that are found in your words. When we allow your words to say what they say, not imposing our own definitions upon your words, and not just assuming, oh, I know what that means. It means this. Lord, through study, we find great treasures. And we find, Lord, things that have been lost for a long time. And I'm not sure uh, what you're doing in anybody's hearts tonight. I want to give them an opportunity, Lord, to respond to your word. Even if that response is just, you know, I... I don't think I know the Bible. I am not comfortable to protect that which is mine. 
Lord, they're at a church where they can learn, where they can grow, if they would just commit themselves to study. Lord, they have a pastor who they can ask anything, who would be so glad to sit down with them and spend time teaching them these things. Lord, I pray that we would consider what we can do better and what we might have done and how we can set these things right. Thank you for your words, these incredible things, Lord, that you have entrusted us with. Pray these things in Christ's name.